thought that I would spend live. Hi everybody, welcome to Forest Road School of Ceramics and the full-time students final show. Um, I'm going to stay out here just for a little while to let you all be admitted to the call um, because I know we want as many people ready as possible. Um, and just to say that the students have been working really, really hard and the work looks amazing and I think you're going to really enjoy it. I'm really sorry that you aren't able to be here in person, but actually I think that you will get a lot out of it because you'll hear the students talk about their work, which doesn't normally happen. So um, I'm really excited. They've worked so hard. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take you into the room and we're going to pan around the room with the camera and show you all the work. And then then we're going to individually go to each student and they're going to give you a talk about what they've done and their inspirations. Um, so that's what's going to happen. And then at the very end, we're going to have Q&A. So what I'd really like you all to do is to put your questions, if you could write your questions in the chat and any comments you want to make. And I have Elaine Bolt and Effie Gibson um, in there who are my wonderful support tutors um, and they are selecting all your questions and they will be asked each of the students at the end um, so uh, we won't be able to obviously necessarily do all your questions but we'll try and do as many as we can at the end so that's what's going to happen um, so I hope you're going to enjoy so let's let's go in Ah, oh. so let's look down at, do you want to scan around the whole room? This is Ros's work, this is Annie's work, there's Annie, Hello. there's Ros and Sarah waiting, Alicia, Vasu and Lison. So here we are, this is Rosie's beautiful work and you can see the incredible colours that she has achieved here with the glazes. This is the river clay she worked with. This beautiful piece. Colors are amazing. She works to you really lovely how she works with the glazes in a very painterly way. Move more slowly. Sorry, this is the first time we've done this, so please excuse any hiccups. These are Annie's tiles. She wants to be an architectural ceramicist. Let's actually speak a little louder. I hope you can all hear me, but I'm just really showing you it all at the moment. Beautiful glazes, well done, amazing work. That's a comment coming through, thank you. Amazing. 
These are all tiles that she made with river clay and all the different clays she found locally. We're going to come back to these and put some more later, aren't we? This is Sarah's work. She worked with Chino glazes, reduction fired. And over here are our two wonderful artists, Elaine Bolt and Effie Gibson. They're the ones on the computer checking all your questions. <laughs> Thank you, you two. Yes, please ask lots of questions. We'll write them down and at the end you can we'll we'll relay them to Katrina and we'll ask ask everybody questions that you tell us. These are Lison's pieces, these wonderful miniature figurines that are so stunning. These are, act this is actual mold, would you believe? She loves things decaying. Here we have Vasus. These are reduction fired as well. She likes distressing the surface.
just to show you the scale, look how tiny these little pieces are. And here we have Alicia's work. She's inspired by the sea. You see she's even bought some sand from Barbados. And she's working with beautiful crackle glazes. Lovely to go into this surface of that one. And then finally, we have Roz's work over here. Oh, we've actually done Roz. <laughs> so we're now, we've done Roz, apologies. <laughs> so now we're going to go to each of the students in turn. And they're going to talk about their work and tell you about their interests, as I said. So we're now going to go to Vasi first, who's behind you, Brandon. <laughs> Hi. Um, okay, so I'm Vasu Reddy, and this is completely weird, but I expect all of us are going to be feeling really weird here. Um, in this show, um, I kind of wanted to capture, explore, and maybe capture something of the beauty of the lost and the broken that we see all around us everywhere all the time, that mostly we don't recognize as beautiful, we dismiss. So um, this display here, and this particularly, touches on loss for me in two different ways. One is um, talking of lost civilizations and lost makers of things. Um, I was thinking in particular about ruins that I saw in Thessalonica last year, or the year before, and in uh, Harappa, in the Indus Valley civilization, earlier this year. Um, and it's kind of, it, it's, it's a bizarre feeling that things are there, the artifacts are there, even though the makers have gone and I wanted to bring them into the present. It touches on loss for me in another way as well, which is lost childhood. So for me, all these little, um, um, I keep getting asked, why do, you make, why do you like making these little things? And I think, I don't really know the answer. I just know that it, when, we, when I was young and we used to have these Diwali celebrations with displays of household scenes and tiny little paper mache figures from a village nearish where I come from. And it was like, there was something powerfully moving about them. So in a sense, this is a kind of an attempt to recapture 
uh, bring that back to life in a way. But also another thing, which is um, uh, here actually, ancient graffiti. So this was the thing that I got the biggest kick out of. So these are ancient Harappan inscriptions there on ancient Harappan miniature walls. And this is a, a modern graffiti. So all my Indian contacts will probably know exactly what that means and nobody else will. And I'm not going to tell you either. <laughs> Um, I keep getting moved, and I don't really know why. I have been throughout this course getting moved by patterns, right? And the violation of patterns. So, for example, if you take these lines here, right? They, for me, remind me of the Byzantine walls in Thessalonica and, and, and the breakages in there. Uh, and I kind of wanted to re recapture that, but it's also patterns uh, on rock faces, you know, sort of serial lines and, and things that get broken and so on. So one of the things that I wanted to do here in these larger pots was trying to um, was trying to capture these patterns and push them to the point of breaking. Um, and you can, you can see kind of um, so I. I've been very moved by patterns, right? And it's not just in rock faces, but also in my previous life, I used to be a psychologist. And I've really been very interested in how very young babies also create patterns, pick them up and violate them by teasing. And I think you can see that in art as well. Um, overall, I think one of the things that, um, has struck me when I'm doing this is that if you if you look at things that are broken, sometimes I found them honestly more alive than unbroken things. And I kind of wonder why that is. I, and it didn't occur to me until last night that things that are broken keep doors open for us. They don't shut them. Things that are unbroken are bounded, right? Or kind of closed. So I think I'm gonna stop waffling there. <laughs> You, Firstly, that was wonderful. There's a vulnerability about your work that's just so beautiful and human. I do love it. So now we'll go to Lison, who is here. Hi, <laughs> um, so, um, to explain the work I've been doing in the past three months, um, I think for me what was important was to. Um, understand or try to understand the vulnerabilities in the material. So, for example, if you look here, I would throw uh, the clay on the ground and see what happens. And then by throwing it, um, a monolith came out of it. And then I started studying a little bit more about this. And then this is more the fired one with, um, with the ash. And then, but also I would be collecting little elements all around. So you can see this is a mushroom and this is wadding that has been molding. So I think for me, um, all of these experimentation also, when I'm making um, vessels, was questioning how can I, how can a vessel or an object stand with dignity, but also stay humble? And I think that was throughout the entire time here was what was in my mind. It's like, how can you stand with dignity, but yes, yeah, stay humble. So it's, it's been a lot of part of my work. And also another element that was very important for me was the early morning walks. And I would be walking around and somehow it made me think that there's something greater than ourselves. And then that's why if you look here, there's all these little objects that I found on the walks, and, but then also it's part of a bigger hole. Um, so you have the, the wood here, and then, I mean, this I made in a, in a different course, but it's just like all of these objects for me are, are part of the body of work as well, rather than just the, the clay. So, um, and also I would like to imagine that all of the vessels that I made or the objects, the vessel will be used for a feast with friends and that's maybe this here. And then also all the little objects would maybe use into 
making a place where you can feel at peace and at rest, especially in, in 2020. Um, so to create a little space where, where you feel a bit more at ease. And I think for me, that's the, the sort of way I'm thinking with this. And also there's the little female uh, figures just right here. Um, we went to pick up some river clay that is just around the, the school. And I just started working with the river clay and then just to work with it came the female form. And I started, the more I made, the more affection I had for them and the more I can see all the, their little personality. Um, and these are with different firings, but they're all from clay that's been found in gardens and in rivers. And so it, it was a very, very nice exploration. Um, um, so overall for me, this was very much an exercise of accepting and letting go. Uh, this three months has been very intense, but also the clay has taught me somehow to, um, to stay humble because it's, there's something you can't control and those little elements that you can control then it just grounds you down. And that was a very good, very good um, experience. So thanks guys. <laughs> thanks Lizanne, that's wonderful. I think you, you obviously show such a raw, such a love for the raw material. Mm. Okay. Mm. There's again such beauty in the sort of vulnerability of the work. It's, it's very emotional and it's very beautiful. So thank you, Lizanne. Thank you. So we have Sarah next. Here's Sarah. Hello. Hello. Well, hello to everybody. It's very weird that you're you're not here with us. Um, I much uh, prefer not to be on camera doing this, but thank you for coming. I'm kind of yeah more used to being behind the camera. Um, and my photography has been uh, the medium that I've used in the past. It's a medium that very focused on the surface of things. Here are some pictures that um, I've taken from around Emerson College and the site where we are. And they very much influenced then my work. They've become much part of the process of working with the clay. Um, and it's that surface of the clay body that has been then particularly uh, of interest for me to work on and I've explored that in different ways um, largely through carving through some influences of, of, of pieces of wood where um, they were gouges out from wood and folds in fabric and um, that I've, I've found myself just using wires and springs to kind of carve away from the clay, faceting into the body of the clay in which to kind of start to form pieces. And the other really obvious way in which um, I've you know, taken to looking at the surface of, of the piece is through glazing. It's been an absolute passion to, to explore the glazing process. People who are close to me will have heard me talking about my, my glaze ex experiments and reading on glazes no end. And um, I really, really enjoyed the process of uh, exploring a glaze kitchen and playing with that transformational energy of fire in the kilns. We've got, we've had access, incredible resources and access to different kilns here. Um, these have been made in uh, gas kilns. So with reduction firing, which gives these incredibly rich, um, which uh, ex uh, expressions in the clay body, which um, is very different then to firing in the electric kilns, but all offer their own unique kind of quality. But um, for me, that's been, yeah, a really wonderful part of the process. Um, making up my own glazes, I'm, I'm proud to say that I've got now a few glazes that I feel I've created and I'll be using on, on different pieces in the future and exploring further. Fantastic, Sarah. I love the work. Um, I love how you obviously enjoy using the tools and, and letting the tool express do its thing with the clay and the clay express through that and the edges and how the glazes catch on edges. It's, they're beautiful. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Thank Sarah. You. Thank you. So we're now going to go to Annie. This is Annie. Hi. Hello. <laughs> um, okay. I uh, am very interested in uh, 
effect with ceramics, um, which could be expressed uh, as tiles. And in this, in my uh, exhibition here, I have quite a few tile pieces. Um, each of these are small samples, really, that um, could be worked up on a larger scale. My main inspiration uh, for these are the natural world and geometry, and geometry expressed in a very organic and loose way. Um, I'm very interested as well in uh, contrasting surface textures, colours and form that create pattern. What we're looking at here are my experiments in the local clay that we found in the riverbanks um, near Emerson College and other clays from around the Forest Row area that have been kind of wanted and given to me. Um, I set myself the task of lime blending clays with uh, stoneware and earthenware and then firing at different temperatures to see what colour combinations I could get from the clays. These are about two thirds uh, of, of the experiment results that I got. Um, I can just, maybe before we talk about that one. Absolutely. Sorry. <laughs> these, uh, the, these, the, the colour tests were then moved on to this larger piece up here, which uh, is a work in progress. Um, I was, I'm, I'm very drawn to these warm, pinky terracotta colours. You often see uh, this colour in brickwork and also in, uh, in, in countries where they use a lot of uh, natural, natural clays. I uh, spent some time in Mexico at the start of this year, which was hugely inspirational for me in terms of colour, in terms of form, in terms of relief work in, in tiles and you can see that inspiration expressed here. As well as tiles, I created some more abstract pieces. This is a small sample here, uh, created early on in the course actually, uh, combining different types of clays and porcelain, uh, oxidation fires, and with glasses as well. I very much like the mixture of materials and the bowls we're looking at now um, are uh, stoneware stone grown bowls with mixtures of glazes and glass in them as well. Uh, I think we'll just quickly talk about this, this, last, this last one. Uh, I was very keen to um, create some tiles that weren't square or rectangle, um, or straight solid for that matter. And I took inspiration from Escher's Tessellated Birds for this piece. Again, these are just small samples that could be imagined on a much larger scale, creating an environment around you. Wonderful, Annie, that's great. She spent so long digging up these claims, I can't tell you. She's been wading through rivers along with Ros, um, collecting clay and being attacked by cows and all sorts. So she's been amazing. She's worked so hard on these wild clays and looking at all the colours. And I love all the colours you've achieved with all those different clays. It's just subtle but beautiful. Well done, Annie. Mm -hmm. So now we have Alicia, who's here. Hi, everyone. Um, okay, so I guess I have to start. Uh, by explaining where I'm from. Uh, I'm from Barbados, which is a little island in the east of the Caribbean. Um, one, uh, so I guess it kind of follows that the sea and ocean are just sort of integral to who I am. It's just, I've been around all of its creatures and um, just everything to do with the ocean for as long as I've ever known. Um, and so, one of the things that I was doing before I came here was uh, I went on a walk on the beach to try and collect some of the things from the ocean. Um, I really like to dive and uh, one of the things that I really love, like one of my favorite places is really the reef um, off of the coast. 
and so something about the reef that it's more the feeling for me of the reef and how I'm being there that really uh, just sort of like gets to me. I just uh, um, I tried to capture that in the work that I wanted to develop here. And so, um, right, before coming to Emerson, I actually had, uh, you know, collected some things uh, from, the, from the beaches. And, um, right, so some of the things I had collected would have been the sand, uh, we have this coral sand, which is basically just made up of all of the shells and the corals and, um, you know, everything here would have been alive at some point and, and that's just something that's very special to me. Um, so I tried to use the sand in my, uh, in the actual play. That was one of the first tasks and I just quickly realized that it, they did not mix at all. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, so actually the clay explodes when you fire it with the sand in it, just so you know. <laughs> um, right, so, um, when I was thinking about the reef, uh, it had occurred to me that whenever I'm diving there, um, I just I have this moment where I'm feeling extremely overcome with anxiety um, in that transition into the deeper water. Um, it just happens in that transition, and there is something really serene about it, and maybe transformative. Um, and it's probably because you know you just have to sort of let go and just get comfortable with the task that you have at hand and um, just sort of trust that you are gonna make the right decisions when you need to in order to get through it. And that definitely parallels with what's been, uh, what I've been going through here where I'm just in this beautiful place and I have a challenge at hand and to try and develop my ceramics and get better with it. And um, I just had to trust that I would, learn what I needed to and make the right decisions. Um, and so before I got here, I actually didn't know that I, uh, I didn't know very much about wheel throwing, um, which is partly why many of my, my forms now are um, wheel thrown. So there's, they started on, on the wheel. It was something that I decided I had to learn and I had to push myself to learn. Um, so, all of the bowls are um, altered, uh, wheel thrown and then altered. Um, and it was just really to sort of convey that feeling that I get um, again when I'm there at the reef. It's like serene and floaty and it, um, the colors were part of just to try and put the colors together with the forms to convey that feeling. So yeah, um, the glazes, I tried to have uh, like a contrast in the, the glazes. Um, I knew I needed glassy, glossy uh, glazes in order to really convey the feeling, but also uh, because the reef is so rocky and, uh, you know, textural, I needed something that also, um, you know, showed that contrast between the two. And so I adapted uh, for the glossy glazes, I adapted this uh, snowflake crackle glaze by, um, that was based off of a, a glaze by Linda Bloomfield. And uh, I just adjusted these glazes and tried to come at the right, uh, you know, until I just uh, got to the right, um, the right colors for the feelings that I was having about the, the experience. And um, for my dry glazes, I used um, some glazes by Regina Hines, which are lithium based and low fired. Um, so um, I had to really experiment with lots of making techniques in order to produce this body of work. Um, I had to learn about reduction firing and um, you know, play around with um, high fire oxidation. <laughs> um, um, and all sorts of you know other things and um, all sorts of other things that you know just got the feeling that I was going for. Um, so that's really um, all that I can say about it. Um, I hope you enjoy. And you see them wonderful. They're, there's something so wonderfully floaty, and you can see them under the water, and the currents <laughs> running across them, and all the 
such a lovely movement and the glazes are so soft. Well done. Well done. So finally we have Rod. Yeah, who made these wonderful. Hi there. Thank you for coming along today. Really lovely to see you, if I only could see you. Um, um, I'm a Roz. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a thrower. <laughs> I'm a thrower and um, I've had my studio since uh, 2011 and I really wanted to um, expand what I did. I do raku and smoke firing um, and throw, but I have to mention this course, particularly it's a beautiful course. I have really progressed with my throwing. I've learned lots of techniques. Um, not only from Katrina, but also um, from the visiting um, artists. So, um, in particular, um, Daniel Williams. Um, I've um, I loved his um, his his throwing, and um, he what he did um, was he he put stones and uh, into his clay and throws with the clay, um, and uh, he also to get um, Taller forms, he uses coils to get that uh, uh, to get that height. So this was um, that. I also I was blown away on the first day, of course, because we went um, we went to the river to dig the clay. I've never even thought of doing that before, um, and um, it was a great experience. We went back there again and went through in waders um, up to our chests was chased by some very angry cows who came into the water, were trying to get to us. Um, it was a bit of a scary experience, um, but here you have, you can see, this is the river clay applied to stoneware temperatures, mixed with porcelain, that's what the white is. And you can see um, here the porcelain, um, the layers of white. Um, it really is quite a fabulous uh, thing to do. And we dug that clay up and we threw it straight away uh, with all those impurities in. And in addition, um, I wanted to use Daniel's techniques to add um, uh, stones to them. So I love colour. I particularly love turquoise. Um, I love the green blue that you get on the sea when the sun is shining. And this is what I'm trying to do here. So these pieces here, um, um, I've, these are uh, uh, two sections, um, inspired by Hans Koper. Um, I adore his stuff. Um, and I wanted to choose uh, a geometric shape together with a nice roundy organic shape um, that you see in the moon jars. It's a very um, characteristic shape um, of Hans Koper's. And you see it through a lot of his work. So um, another inspiration on this course was Linda Bloomfield. Thank you, Linda. Um, uh, oh, no. No. <laughs> um, who uh, really uh, was the most wonderful giving teacher in relation to glazes. And, um, so I was able to uh, conquer my fear of glazes and uh, really go for it. Um, and um, this one there was a... a, a um, I'm going to call it the flip it um, bottle, um, just to be kind, but um, it was falling apart on the wheel and uh, Katrina said, um, I'll just get rid of it. So I slapped it and um, um, with some expletives and mm -hmm. as soon as I did, Katrina said, oh my goodness, that is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact it is. So it's um, this is my work. It's turquoise. It's the colours of the sea. Um, it's playing with different um, uh, techniques. Peter Beard was also an uh, inspiration. Also using uh, latex and um, wax to um, layer the glazes. Um, and um, a fundamental thing that I adore is drippy glazes. And you get really, really rich uh, colours from those bricks because they go over and over each other. You get thick bits, you get thin bits. So you really get that lovely variation. Um, and you can see it specifically in, in these, these moon jars just here, which I love, I must say. Um, anyway, that well done. is me. Yeah. <laughs> So Ros, your work's just great. I love how she's been exploring the glazes. It's really difficult working with glazes and a lot of the students don't like to do it too much. And I think that's very brave of you. And you've been so successful. The work looks so 
painterly and the layering is just fabulous. So well done you. Thank you. So we'll now go to questions, Q and A session. So are you all ready for Q and A? Elaine is going to read out some questions for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I've got a question for, um, oh, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone for the fantastic questions that you've written in and all the lovely comments and we'll hope we'll be able to pass on all the loves and love and thanks that you've been sending in. So thank you for that. Um, but some great questions from people. I've got a question for Sarah from Fatima. Uh, Sarah, um, did you create the glaze yourself? I did, I did. I, used, I went into the, the room down the end in the glaze kitchen and just worked with all the different um, elements that Katrina has in there. She has everything. And so working with base glazes from different places, doing loads of research, reading. And then there were some, some few good kind of mistakes that turned into interesting glazes down to a little bit of dyslexia and a little bit of wrong reading of uh, labels and putting the wrong thing in and developing some really good glazes in the process. So yeah, it was, um, I can, yeah, I can say a lot of them came from a series of, of mistakes and yeah, happy, happy mistakes. Fantastic, Sarah, thank you. Okay, next so I've got a question for Annie. Um, so Nelson has written in, uh, say, um, were your glazes in oxidation? Oxidization? Um, well, that was in, most of the ones here were um, fine in oxidation. Yes, um, the bowls, they all were, with the exception of uh, this one with uh, cobalt and um, ash glaze and mixed ash and uh, glass as well, which was fired in reduction, but the rest were all oxidation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Basu, I've got a question for you. So, uh, Tula Imri has written in to say uh, that she loves your small pieces. And I know you, you've covered this a little bit of what you said earlier, uh, but she wants to know more about um, how you started playing the scale. And also, uh, Preeti Mathur uh, uh, wanted to know uh, if it was because of the Garanda. Oh, I'm saying that completely wrong, sorry. <laughs> Speaking Telugu pretty and then I might understand. Um, how, did I get, how did I get involved with the smaller things? How did you start playing the scale? Um, I was making small things before I came here and then Elaine, a certain Elaine Bolt happened to show me that you could make small things by throwing this porcelain off the hump. So I started doing that and it was just unbelievable because the porcelain is just, you know, the hump just never finishes. Anyway, after many, many attempts, I, when I was trying to um, build, trying to actually put it into uh, um, the ruins, the co contrasting the objects with the ruins, sort of this idea of loss, I had to make them smaller and smaller and smaller. So that kind of has been a challenge. I haven't finished exploring it actually, but there we are. Oh, well, I asked that question just so that you could name check me. Yes, quite. <laughs> okay, right. Uh, Lisa, I've got a um, comment for you mm -hmm. uh, from Katya, mm -hmm. um, who really likes your strong concept um, and uh, loves the, the, you talking about um, being humble. And, um, and she found it very moving. Mm. Um, and she loved the respect that you have towards the materials and that really came through. Is that something that you really value in your work? Uh, yeah, I think for me it was very much about, I mean, letting the materials speak for itself, especially with the figures. That's sort of how they came through. It was really just the material and I was just taking some pieces out, but it was very much just like leaving them untouched. And, speak for themselves. So m most of it is, um, yeah, is based on that. Fantastic. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, um, I've got a, a comment for Alicia from Linda Bloomfield. Oh. <laughs> she's, she's been commenting all along saying how wonderful it is working. Uh, and Linda Bloomfield is a um, fantastic maker. So uh, she wants to know about how you make your uh, shell and fossil patterns. Oh, okay. Um, the shell and fossil patterns, I actually directly uh, press the, the um, shells. Like, so this is an urchin 
that I brought with me uh, just for the course when I went on my walks and another um, shell. So I've just been playing around with all of these different, um, the, the impressions that they make and the patterns and um, using, using these patterns to um, put black slip into to see, you know, what the gla how the glaze would interact with black slip. And so all of the impressions, including this one where I've rubbed on the outside for the textures um, with the low firing lithium glaze, um, they're all using the shells that I collected um, on my, my beach walks. So really that was where they, they come from. Thank you, Lucia. So, um, Thomas, um, I, I, I missed the end of your uh, thought about the but um, I, I, the colours are really striking. Do you feel that colour is, is kind of it's an important part of your work? Oh, it's a very important part of my work. This is what I want to achieve. I want to achieve colours like this. That's, that's the primary. That and the throwing, basically, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, that really comes across. Thank you. Um, well, uh, just as a kind of a little roundup um, for everyone, um, uh, we had a question uh, from, uh, from Caroline, who um, was interested in asking all of you, or any of you, uh, if you have three things that you would feel you could take away from the course. If you could, think, if you could sum it up, what would you say, if anyone has any thoughts? Definitely surrender to the moment. I think clay really teaches you to be in the moment. And the more you can kind of, kind of be present to that moment, the more you can kind of draw on the influences that are happening, and the more that will affect the work. I think it um, um, it really focuses on um, the need to be playful, um, and out of playfulness, creativity comes. Mm -hmm. And I've really found that myself here on this course. Mm -hmm. Um, I think also one of the things which is very similar to what the two of them have been talking about is uh, to really persevere. So in the surrender and the, and the playfulness, um, sometimes you can just want to just stop being playful and stop pursuing mm -hmm. an idea, but pushing that idea and persevering with that idea sometimes really comes up with really great results. And that's something that I've been learning for sure. And I know other people have talked about the same. Um, on the course, so, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I was going to say actually, but I forgot my one joke in my talk. <laughs> I was going to say thank you to John Higgins for pointing me in the direction of breaking things because it's a really convenient thing for a potter. And I think that is one thing that I'm going to take away from here, that there is um, a lot of beauty that can come from strategic breaking or even unintentional things. Um, so, uh, <laughs> we've got a few more, yes, last minute minute few more last minute questions came up. So, Ros, uh, it was, did you add cotton to filler clay or was it there naturally? Oh, no, I added it. Yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a, a question, a really interesting question for all from Nelson. And he asked, was the course more about technique or about personal exploration? That's for everybody to <laughs> 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 Mm. Not technical stuff, and that's what I came here for. I really wanted to expand my my repertoire, and I certainly got that. But then towards the end of the course, we did that our project is very much about personal exploration. I think they have a, they, the course is split into two parts. The first part is twice as long, a couple of months, the second part a month, and the first part you're equipped with all the techniques from. Uh, so half a dozen or more visiting artists, um, our lovely teachers Elaine and Effie, as well as many, many lessons from the children themselves. Um, we get given, we get primed with all this technical knowledge and hands-on experience, and then we kind of get sent off and uh, we get the chance to channel everything we've learned and uh, use, use all the new, new techniques as well as any other techniques we, we, went, we wanted to, to develop our work and, um, and and then it's more about personal development. And personal development is really important. Finding your voice for something is really important. And it felt like an important tutors encourage us into that phase. And I think that, yeah, that's, that's definitely got a prime 
time, place, and importance in the course. So, yes, yeah, so there was there was a really nice um, comment which which was from Nicola, who said, really interesting to see the diversity of ideas and work. Would really love to see, feel, and linger in real life. This is a great alternative given current circumstances then. Thank you. Aww. Thank you. So we will probably say goodbye, but weren't they all amazing? So I'm really proud of them. So thank you. We're going to go and celebrate now. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! So thank you. Thank you to my son, Brandon, the photographer. Yay. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. 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 <laughs> 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 <laughs>